Good morning. Wendy Wright? Yes. I'm Richard Dawkins. Very, Very nice kind to of you, you to do this interview. Yes. Where should we go then? Uh, well, how's this? Okay. Concerned Women of America. Concerned I've looked up, um, America. for America, I do beg <laughs> your pardon. I've looked up some of the things you're concerned about, and one of them is something I'm very concerned about too, which is, which is Darwin and evolution. But why are you concerned about evolution? Yes, well, <laughs> what a person believes about how human beings were created shapes what they believe about human beings. That if we believe that human beings were created out of love, that is by a loving creator and uh, has given each one of us not only a material body but a spirit and a soul, we that are more likely to treat other people with respect and dignity. Yes, but you have to contend with facts, don't you? And I mean, if evolution is a scientific fact, you might as well be concerned about gravity or the Milky Way, might yes. you? Yes. Well, uh, there's been an effort within the scientific community to censor out information uh, against evolution that proves that evolution may not be as many scientists believe. Uh, there have been uh, many times in which um, evidence that was brought forward to, claim, to uh, bolster the idea of evolution turned out to be fraudulent. What's so an what, example of that? So what we um, argue for is to teach the controversy. Don't censor out the facts that go against evolution, uh, such as the famous uh, pig's tooth, uh, the, the tooth that was claimed to be a, a, an example of a, a prehistoric man and turned out to just be the tooth of a pig. There are uh, numerous examples like that. So teach the controversy rather than try and censor out the information that shows yes. that evolution you know, is, is questionable. Seriously, there isn't a controversy. There may be a controversy uh, uh, within evolution about certain details, but, but the fact of evolution is, is uncontroversial. I mean, whether you like it or not, we're cousins of chimpanzees, we're slightly more distant cousins of monkeys, etc. I mean, pig's teeth are really irrelevant. Of course you can dig up mistakes and, and, and mm. even outright fraud. I mean, the Piltdown hoax was an outright fraud. But yes. that, that was never used as evidence for evolution. It was just a, a particular case of somebody in the 1920s who, who fraudulently made up a fossil. There's no evidence of evolution from one species to another. There's microevolution within a species, but not going from one species to another. Oh, really? And actually, yeah. you're, you're, the way you have framed this and mm. your very close-mindedness mm -hmm. uh, really is a very good example of the kind of uh, censorship we see within the scientific yes. community yes. that won't even allow discussion about the controversy that says uh, that we can't even discuss uh, any evidence that might show that evolution is questionable. Right. Where, where did you study science? Well, see, that's the point. Uh, scientists are now claiming that they're the only ones that can speak on this issue. And yet when people who look at the evidence uh, go to the Smithsonian uh, Museum on Natural History, and when we look for where's the evidence to show evolution from one species to another, all we find are drawings, illustrations. There aren't the uh, actual material evidence showing it. So while there are attempts to say that only scientists can speak on this, what we have are scientists that are then creating a, um, an isolated uh, community and saying that we're the ones, uh, almost like a, it's almost like a religion in which only scientists are allowed to speak and teach on it and to teach everyone else. And everyone else must believe okay. what the scientists, what particular scientists say. But the scientists who question evolution are being censored out, are being blackballed out of the scientific community but and, not, and being told that the rest of the world cannot listen to them. Yeah. Um, I mean, the evidence is actually rather substantial. It's, it's not just fossils, you know. I mean, it's DNA. Presumably, you, you're not concerned about DNA. You accept the existence of DNA. D do you? I think DNA helps to prove that each person is an individual created yes. uh, and uh, as distinct from one another. If you look at the DNA of all animals and all plants, what you find is a beautifully arranged hierarchy. You find that our DNA is close to chimpanzees, slightly more distant from monkeys, slightly more distant still from rats, slightly more distant still from lizards. The whole thing falls into a beautiful hierarchical pattern, just like a family tree. It is a family tree. How would you explain that? And where is the evidence? Well, the evidence is in no, the no, DNA. Excuse me. 
Where is the evidence of um, evolution from one species to another species, the macro evolution? Well, it's in the DNA. It's in the DNA, it's in the geographical distribution of species. What you're talking species. about are commonalities, but again, where is the material evidence of, go, of uh, evolution from one species to another species? Well, we obviously have a different conception of what evidence is. Um, scientists accept that as evidence. It's overwhelming massive evidence. But let me come on to something else. It sounds to me as though you've got a, some kind of another agenda. Is it perhaps that your hostility to evolution, which by the way is not shared by bishops and archbishops and people like that, your hostility to evolution perhaps stems from something emotional. Like, I mean, <laughs> is, it, is it that you feel that, that evolution, I mean, I've heard people say, for example, tell me I'm related to a monkey, uh, you know, I'm not related to a monkey. Tell people they're related to monkeys and they'll behave like monkeys. Tell people they're related to pond slime and they'll, they'll behave like pond slime. Is, is, is part of that the hidden agenda behind your rejection of science? There's no hostility and there's no hidden agenda. We've been very upfront with what it is we believe. Mm -hmm. And the ad hominem attacks that um, people who favor evolution use against people who don't buy into that, I think shows the lack of confidence uh, uh, in the evidence. Um, if evolution had so much evidence behind it, then those in favor of evolution would not have to be reduced to ad hominem attacks against those who say, show us the evidence, show us what's lacking. Well, I, do, I think I'd dispute ad hominem, but I think you could understand a certain annoyance. It's a little bit as though a teacher of classics. I'm talking about education now in, in schools and universities. Imagine that a teacher of Latin had to, or a teacher of Roman history, had to contend with people coming along and saying, the Romans never existed, uh, the Latin language is a Victorian invention designed to, um, you know. And, to I, and I think that's a perfect example of the hostility that those who favor evolution have toward those who don't buy into the idea, who say, show us the evidence, and yet those in favor of evolution well, can't show us the evidence that we're I'm, looking I'm for. I'm sorry, but we can show you the evidence. All you need to do is read an elementary textbook of biology. It's all there. Well, uh, inter that's interesting you should bring out the textbooks on biology. We still have textbooks today. Yeah, I know you're going to talk about paper moths, and you're going to talk about Haeckel's embryos. No, no. Uh, in fact, what I was going to talk about is the, what they claim to be the evolution of a fetus in the womb, yes, based on Haeckel's hand drawings, yeah. which have been proven to be false, and yet they continue to be published in sci scientific textbooks. Heckel's embryos are just one little thing. It's a Victorian thing. Plenty of people made mistakes in And Victorian. yet continues to be published in today's textbooks. Well, no longer, actually. But, but I don't think it's really fair, is it, to pick on particular Victorian mistakes. It is a Victorian mistake. Oh, I mean, but it was carried over into the 20th date? century. Yes, and that was a mistake, and, and that's been corrected. But look at the massive evidence that there is today. I can't help feeling that there's some sort of hidden agenda. Maybe I was wrong to say it was a thing about uh, tell people that they're be descended from monkeys and they'll behave like monkeys. Is it something else? I mean, is there some other worry that you if have? If you're looking, you're looking for a so-called agenda, I'll tell you what it is. We believe that human beings should be treated with respect and dignity. Yes. And the reason we well, believe so that, I, the reason we believe that is because um, we can see that God created each one of us. And what we find is that philosophies that are built on evolution oftentimes lead to horrendic, horrific abuses against human beings. And you can see why, because it's drawn on a foundation that says human beings are just material and they should be judged according to their, their utilitarian use. What thing can they provide yeah. for society? Okay. We don't believe that. Yes, okay. We believe that each human being, whether they can supply something to society or not, if they are disabled, if they are young, that they should be treated with the same amount of respect as you and I should be treated. Yes, I mean, I, I, I accept all that, and I, and I agree with that. I mean, I also think humans should be treated with respect. But, but what we have here is an agenda. It's that you want humans to be treated with respect, and therefore, if the scientific facts go against what your perception is, then you're going to distort the scientific facts. Now, why don't you instead accept the scientific facts and say, but we still want to treat humans with respect. Let's look at evolution and let's see that we can indeed hmm. treat humans with because respect what I go back within to, the evolution framework. What I go back to is the evolutionists are still lacking the science to back it up. But in, instead, what happens is science that doesn't bolster the case for evolution gets censored out, such as there is no evidence of evolution from going from one species
species to another species. If that, if evolution had occurred, then surely, whether it's going from birds to mammals or, or even beyond that, surely there'd be at least one evidence. There's a evidence. massive amount of evidence. I'm sorry, but you people keep repeating that like a kind of mantra because you, you just listen to each other. I mean, if only you would just open your eyes and look show at the Show it evidence. to me. Show me the, well, show me the bones. Show me the carcass. Show me the evidence of uh, the in-between stage from one species to another. Every time a fossil is found which is in between one species and another. You guys say, ah, oh, now we've got two gaps where, there are, where previously there was only one. I mean, almost every fossil you find is intermediate <laughs> with something and something else. If that else. were the case, the Smithsonian National His Natural History Museum would be filled with these examples, well, but it, instead it they're is, not. It is. When we talk about intermediates between species, we, we, we're of course not talking about intermediates between modern species. We're not talking about intermediates between dogs and cats. We're talking about intermediates between ancestral dogs and slightly more recent ancestral dogs. Now in the case of humans, uh, since Darwin's time, there's now enormous amount of evidence about intermediates in human fossils. I and mean, we've got various species of Australopithecus, for example. Uh, and these are, I mean, some Australopithecus are intermediate between others and ourselves. Then you've got Homo habilis, Homo erectus. These are intermediate between Australopithecus, which was an older species, and um, Homo sapiens, which is a younger species. I mean, why don't you see those as intermediates? Mm. Evolutionists bear the burden of providing the evidence for uh, those of us who are not scientists to see it. And if the evolutionists had the actual evidence, then it would be displayed in but museums, not just in illustrations. No, I mean, so what I go back to, though, I think there is a bit of a there could be a hidden agenda on the part of those in favor of Darwin in, 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 um, uh, in, in Darwin's own words in which he claimed that there was a difference among the races and that was then used to promote racism. Yeah, that's Victorian. Everybody in Victorian That is the is foundation racist. though. Uh, those who are in favor of evolution often uh, refer back to Darwin and he is quite a hero of the evolutionist well, he is movement. A hero, but, but not with respect to racism. Now, I just told you about Australopithecus, Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Homo sapiens a beautiful, by the way, archaic Homo sapiens and then modern Homo sapiens. That's a beautiful series of You're intermediates. You're still lacking the material evidence. The so material evidence is there. <laughs> go to the museum and look so at it. So what I go back to again is let's look at the what um, evolution uh, and Darwinism has spawned. Let's look at the philosophies that have come out of it that have been so horrific to our world. So we need to look at uh, the philosophies behind and, and that have grown out of evolution. And what we find are the societies that are the most um, loving and caring, uh, the societies that are the most uh, well-functioning, are the ones that have a great respect for human beings, for others, because they recognize that each human being was created individually and is distinct from one another. Interesting enough, regarding that you, you mentioned how the DNA is common among various species, but among human beings, each one of us has distinct DNA. In fact, that's the one, um, um, uh, that's one thing that's uh, quite, uh, a way that, sorry, back up. Um, that's one thing that scientists will use to determine who has committed a crime, is basing it on the DNA evidence. So even DNA helps to show that each human being was created individually. DNA shows that each human being evolved individually. Uh, and of course there are individual differences between human beings, genetic differences, otherwise natural selection couldn't happen. Now I presented you with, I don't have them here obviously, but you can go to any museum and you can see Australopithecus, you can see Homo habilis, you can see Homo erectus, you can see archaic Homo sapiens and modern Homo sapiens. A beautiful series of intermediates. Why do you keep saying present me with the evidence when I've done so? Go to the museum and, and look. I have, I have gone to the museums and well, so have so many of us who still are not convinced have you with seen Evolution. Homo, have, have you seen Homo erectus? And I think that this, this, um, this effort, this rather aggressive effort to try and talk over us and to censor us seems to come out of uh, a, a frustration that so many people still don't believe in evolution. Now, if evolutionists were so confident in their beliefs, there wouldn't be the effort to censor out information that shows uh, that evolution is still lacking and is questionable. I am, I confess to being frustrated, 
it's not about suppression, it's about the fact that I have told you about four or five fossils <laughs> and you seem to simply be ignoring what I'm saying. And I, and Why I, don't you go and look at those fossils? I, and certainly, uh, if they were in the museums, which I've been to many times, then I would look at them objectively. But what I go back they to is, what I go back to is that uh, those, um, the, the philosophy of evolution has been, it can, has led to uh, ideologies that have been so destructive to the human race. It's been misunderstood. I mean, even Hitler could be described as a misunderstanding of of Darwinism, and that's a, a grotesque and, and horrible misunderstanding. And eugenicists, yeah. and those in favor of euthanasia, yes, yes. and those in favor of infanticide. Yes. But wouldn't it be a good idea, instead of pointing to misperceptions of Darwinism, which have been hideously misused politically, if you try to understand Darwinism, then you'd be in a position to counteract these well, horrible misunderstandings. Well, actually, we are oftentimes um, forced by the aggressiveness of those who favor evolution. It's not as if we are hidden from this information that you keep presenting. It's not as if we're uh, it's, it's unknown to us, because we can't get away from it. It's, it's pushed on us all the time. But I think your frustration comes from the fact that so many of us who have seen your information, still don't buy into your ideology. Have you seen Homo erectus? Have you seen Homo habilis? Have you seen Australopithecus? I've, I've asked you that what I've, seen, what I've seen is that in the museums and in the textbooks that whenever they claim that to show the evolution from one species to another, it relies on illustrations and drawings, no, it not, the um, not any can, material evidence. Uh, you might have to go to the Nairobi Museum to see the original fossils, but, but you can see casts of fossils, exact copies of these fossils in uh, any, any major museum. Well, let me, let me ask at. you, why um, are you so aggressive? Why is, it that it's, why, why is it so important to you that everyone believe like you believe? Well, I'm not talking about belief. I'm, I'm talking about facts. I'm talking about, um, I've, I've told you about certain fossils, and Every time I ask you about them, you evade the question and you turn to something else. You well, I can say, even if, again, I say that you can name a few of those, but they still don't show. They still don't prove evolution from the slime to the uh, intricate human body. Well, there should be, if, if we had gone from that, that broad of an evolution, there should be overwhelming tons of material evidence, not just an isolated, uh, no, th isolated thing here, I mean, but again, uh, there is not evidence. I happen to pick human hominid fossils because I thought you'd be most interested in them, but you can find similar fossils for in, from any vertebrate group you care to name. Of course, there are but lots of... But I guess I go back to why is it so important to you that everyone believe in evolution? Why do, why do you seem... You seem to almost feel like it's dangerous for people to believe that human beings were created uh, individually and with a distinctness and created by a creator. Well, Why I, don't, is that I don't like the word belief. I prefer to just uh, ask people to look at the evidence, and I'm asking you to look at the evidence. Well, and, and I'm asking you, why, is, why does it seem so dangerous to you? Why is it so important to you that people not believe in a creator? No, no that's not the point. I mean, the, the, the point is that as a scientist, I'm concerned that children in American schools and in schools elsewhere should be exposed to the evidence and allowed to make up their minds about the evidence. And we completely agree. In fact, that's why the, the, the challenge in America, whenever this debate comes up, uh, is teach the controversy, teach the evidence. Because as it is now, in many cases, school children are only being taught about evolution. They're not being taught about the frauds in evolution and the, the uh, lack of evidence in evolution. So it's actually us who are arguing for teaching all the evidence, not just the ones that are favorable to evolutionists. Well, you could say which controversy. I mean, there are, of course, other creation stories than Genesis. Do you, do you believe that the world is young, for example? Do you believe the world is less than 10,000 years old? Well, um, I, uh, I believe that God created the world. And the time frame it can be unknown. As we look mm. in the Bible, it's hard to know uh, what a, a day, the length of time that might mean in, in that context. Mm. So uh, what I go back to, though, is the human, human being, because that's like what I think we really care about, are human beings. And um, are human beings created through the loving touch of a creator or just came out of slime? Well, if you were to talk to a bishop, the bishop would probably say, yes, human beings were created 
by a loving creator, but he used evolution in order to do it. I mean, that mm -hmm. would be the position of the Archbishop of Canterbury. And that does show that there's a, ver there's a variety of opinions uh, across the board uh, among um, uh, those who may not buy completely into the hardcore ideas of evolution. There are those who believe in, a, in, a, in uh, different levels of evolution within creation, and that really shows kind of a, a creative independence uh, within our movement that seems to be a bit lacking among those who believe believe in evolution and only evolution. But as I've just told you, there are bishops who believe in evolution. Indeed, just about all bishops believe in evolution. And uh, they would say you would, that... You would have to clarify what um, denomination of bishops, okay, to say well, a broad let's uh, say, term um, like that. But the ones I'm familiar with are Anglican and, there you and, go. and Catholic. But, <laughs> but that's okay. I mean, there are, there are certainly lots of very, very senior church people who do believe in evolution. And so there is a broad... I mean, there are those... and There are, there are others who are not bishops, but who are scientists or also Christian or also Jews, uh, and who um, believe in evolution, but who think that the idea of God kind of intervening in this sort of conjuring trick way is rather blasphemous. I mean, I've, I know evolutionist colleagues who are, who are also devout Christians who think that it's to the greater glory of God to study the way science actually is, rather than to mm. try to bring God in as a kind of magician who kind of, you know, waves a wand and things happen. Yeah, and, and I think, to I God? think and, and that is a, a misinterpretation, misframing of what, of what we believe. Um, we believe that God do, can and does intervene uh, in, uh, in, um, in, throughout history and in life. And we say, see that as like a, a loving father that's involved in his family and his children. Uh, it's not that the father is dictating everything to, to his children, what they can and cannot do. Uh, as a Christian, I believe in free will, that God created us with the ability to make our own decisions. Some of those decisions are bad decisions, some are good. And so to say that God intervenes in our lives, even in the creation, well, perhaps even especially in the creation of our life, is reflecting um, a belief in a very loving God. Yes, and there are others who say that, that, that God set up the laws of physics the laws of the universe. Mm -hmm. and he did it in such a cunning way that when the time came, evolution got going and eventually produced yes. us. And isn't that a rather grand and noble vision? Of it is, and in fact, we believe that as well. We believe that, that science is unlocking the mysteries of the, the laws put in place by God, that God created this earth with certain uh, laws like the law of gravity to allow it to function and and uh, that science is actually undis is discovering and unlocking the secrets of the laws that God put in place among which are evolution which follows from <laughs> the laws of chemistry and physics under under, under the right conditions so and that could be the the working out of God's purpose. Couldn't, and, it? couldn't and, evolution be the working out of God's purpose? And uh, uh, there are many people who do believe that uh, God uh, does use a, a form of, um, of creation where evolution is a part of that. The evolution of, of uh, 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 back up on that, um, uh, that there are people, uh, there are many people who do believe that God intervenes uh, in this, this world uh, and uses various laws like gravity or um, progression to create a more uh, stable world, uh, a better world. So uh, I don't think that there is much, um, I don't think there's the, there should be as much dissension uh, between our camps that uh, we can come to respect one another. In fact, we do. We respect evolutionists for their beliefs. What we would hope is that there would be as much respect on the evolutionist part toward us so that we could have a, a, a dialogue without re being reduced to ad hominem attacks and accusing others of having hidden secret uh, hostile agendas. I don't want to be respected for my beliefs. I want you to respect the facts. I want you to look at the facts. Don't respect me. I don't want respect. I want you to go to museums and look at the facts and don't believe what you've been told that there is no evidence. Just go and look <laughs> at the evidence. <laughs> yes, and it's what I would funny. say... I mean, uh, um, re yeah. re really, go, go and... I've told you about hominid fossils. You can go and look at the evolution <laughs> of the horse. You can go and look at the evolution of the early mammals. You can go and look at the evolution of fish. You can go and look at the transition from fish to 
land living amphibians and reptiles any of those things you'll find in any good museum just open your eyes and look at the facts and I would say open your eyes and see the um, communities that have been built by those who believe in a loving God who created each one of us and what I find is that that is um, uh, the kind of world uh, that most of us would want to live in one in which there is a deep respect for other being other human beings because they are created by a loving God however that creation came about out. You can have your beliefs, we can have our beliefs, and both can be based on different, on, on evidence, even the same evidence. Uh, but I think fundamentally, where our differences come down to is whether there was a creator or whether there was not a creator. I, I liked one phrase you used there. You talked about the sort of society in which we wish to live. And I, I will, I'll tell you quite freely that a society based upon Darwinian principles is exactly the sort of society I do not wish to live in. Mm -hmm. It would be a terrible society. It would mm -hmm. be a sort of um, um, George Bush kind of society, if I can put it like that, or, or Margaret Thatcher kind of society. I do not wish to live in a Darwinian world. I do, however, respect facts, and I do recognize that uh, the facts of science show that, we, that, we, that the world of nature is a Darwinian world. It's a very unpleasant world. It's a thoroughly unpleasant world, not the kind of world we wish to live in. So let us understand it so that we can construct the kind of society in which we wish to live, which will be a non-Darwinian society, with a sort of society which, is, which departs from Darwinian principles. A society that was based on Darwinian principles would be a ruthless free market economy in which the rich trample the poor, uh, in which um, it would be sort of opposite of a liberal socialist society, in fact. In a way, I'm rather surprised, uh, if, if we're talking politics, that the right wing in America is so hostile to Darwin. If we're going to be naive about applying science to politics, you ought to be in favor of Darwin. And I'm, in, I'm against Darwin where politics is concerned, but you cannot argue with scientific facts. Mm. Uh, you actually helped to make uh, my case quite well, and that is that a philosophy that is drawn out of Darwinism would be extremely uh, brutal and in fact has been. Uh, that has been the experience. I, I've and just said that. I've, I've, right. I've agreed with that. And yes. uh, that's why um, the societies that have been built on a viewpoint that God created each one of us, however he did it, that's part of the science of unlocking, of discovering how that was done. But recognizing that there is a loving creator helps to build a society that is more than just livable, but pleasant. At Concerned Women for America, we have state chapters and even more local chapters. And one of the things they've been, they've been involved in is the debate over uh, teaching evolution or intelligent design in the schoolrooms. And the position we've taken is teach the controversy. Teach all the information, not just selected information that promotes one viewpoint, which most of the time that's evolution but let's teach all the information so that the school children can learn how to think for themselves and come up to their own come to their own conclusions nobody could possibly object to teaching children to think for themselves. I wish I wish that were the case that people would not object to teaching all the information or teaching children in a manner so they can think for themselves but sadly there's been a very heavy-handed effort in the United States to clamp down not allow any teaching that is contrary to evolution even to the point of court orders when you say teach the controversy, it would be nice. I mean, of course, scientists teach controversies all the time. There's a lot of controversy in science. There's evidence on one side, there's evidence on the other side. In this case, however, we have a very large amount of evidence in favor of evolution. But the evidence on the other side is not evidence in favor of anything else. It's actually looking for little gaps. It's looking for little um, things that, that allegedly evolution can't explain. Say, Look, we found something they can't explain. That must mean God did it. Um, it's not, that's not, it doesn't sound like science, does it? That it's, sounds like if it's, looking for if gaps. If it's evidence, then, those, then scientists should be in favor of teaching evidence, even if they may discount the evidence, even if they think it's uh, inconsequential. As a scientist, scientists should be committed to teaching truth. Yes, but I, I think you didn't understand what I said. I said on the one side there is evidence. On the other side, there is a looking for apparent lack of evidence. There is no positive evidence. But that is what science is, science is about. Science is taking a theory and challenging it to see if it can stand up. That's right. And so while people may not like uh, when the evidence doesn't stand up to uh, further testing, uh, that, but that's what science is about. Yes, well, that is what science is about. But uh, there, there are no cases known to me, at least, where science 
where, where, where it doesn't stand up. I mean, uh, there, are, there are cases see, where it's work needs to be done, and of course science flourishes on finding places where more work needs to be done. That's how science advances. Mm -hmm. uh, as you mentioned, uh, what's known to you. And I, am, I think that's why we need a variety of people looking at theories and challenging it. Because if it's one person who's dictating what can be challenged or can or what evidence is substantial or not, then we have a dictatorship. In science, uh, scientists should be free to challenge theories and not be hemmed in, not be restricted by the current zeitgeist of those who are the, the almost the high priests of science well, of that, that of course, day. is right. I mean, I, I agree with that. But ca can you point to any positive scientific evidence in favor of creation? Uh, I think the, the fact, as you pointed out, DNA, I think DNA helps to show that each one of us are individuals. And yes, but they have to be individuals distinct. for evolution to work. I mean, uh, I, I don't think that's the case. I think well, the, the fact sorry, that each one, I think that each one of us are distinct, um, that no two of us are exactly alike, that that helps to show that there is some intervention at the point of each person's creation. Do you know about the Darwinian theory that it's about individual variation being selected? There has to be individual hmm. variation or Darwinism wouldn't well, work. What also seems to, sh to be shown in the scientific evidence is that mutations die out. And uh, we don't have good evidence of positive mutations being the ones that uh, are then built on. Because if they're a mutation, they're alone. So in order for something to rise up and have more of it, you need to have a good base uh, to, to choose from. Um, for, for example, a recessive gene in a person. It, uh, both parents may have brown eyes, and yet a child may have blue eyes. And that's because there's enough of the gene in their ancestors to have brought out that recessive gene. And that's evidence against evolution? I think that shows, that helps to show the, the individual nature of each person. Uh, that, that, that God created us with genes, with DNA, and uh, that he will even use, he use that to, um, uh, to show his creative element in each person. The fact that you can have two people, a man and a woman, could have 13 children, 16 children, and each one is completely distinct from one another. Uh, that shows that even though they came from a com common parentage, that yet there's still a creative element for each one of those human beings. Do you actually know what Darwin's theory of natural selection is? Mm. Uh, I think I know enough because it gets pounded into us by uh, those who do simply won't allow for other information, well, that don't do want other pounding. information I, to come I forward. I won't do any pounding, but just let me tell you what it is. There is individual variation. Every individual, apart from monozygotic twins, is different from every other individual. That's absolutely fundamental to the Darwinian theory. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens is that among that variety of individuals, some survive better than others, some reproduce better than others. That's how we get evolution. Mm -hmm. You couldn't have evolution unless there was individual variation. You must not keep thinking that because <laughs> there's individual variation, that's somehow <laughs> evidence against evolution. So I come back to you, and why do you reject the idea that there is a creator who's involved in the creation of human beings, whether it was the initial creation and then he left, or is involved in the uh, creation of each human being who's ever lived on Earth? Well, as I've said, there are, there are plenty of ways in which God could be involved in, in creation of the universe, in creation of life, but Darwinian natural selection demands individual variation. That's why you must stop using individual variation <laughs> as evidence against evolution. It's evidence once, for evolution. Once I was uh, going through the uh, Smithsonian uh, History, uh, Natural History Museum um, with uh, dear uh, relatives of mine, and one of them was a severely handicapped little girl who can't do anything for herself. She can't talk, she can't walk, she can't feed herself, she can barely sit up. And when a person, the, one of the people I was with, turned to me and said, do you believe in evolution? And I said, I think this little girl is a perfect example of why evolution is wrong. Uh, because here's someone who cannot take care of herself, and yet she has a spirit. She's not just a material being. And that's one difference I find between uh, the ideology of Darwinism and evolution and those who believe in a loving God is, that, is the idea of a spirit and a soul uh, that is not material 
and it's something that it makes us distinct from animals. Do you think that children should be taught critical thinking? at school. In fact, uh, the, that is uh, what we argue for, is that children to be taught um, evidence uh, uh, so that they can uh, uh, decide for themselves, so they can figure out for themselves what is truth. Right. Do you understand what I was saying when I was explaining about natural selection requiring individual variation? I, I do, but I also come back and I, I haven't heard you answer uh, whether um, you have a problem with this idea of God being involved in the creation of each individual human being, not just perhaps being the one that got it all started. Well, I do have a problem with that because I've seen the evidence and I know that individual variation comes from genetics, it comes from DNA, and I know where it comes from and uh, it's a very well worked out story, it's in every textbook. I mean, we differ because we have different genes. And, and do, you, di different do, you, genes. Sorry, go on. do you believe in a spirit or a soul? I believe in uh, a spirit or a soul in the sense of uh, my own consciousness, which is a manifestation of my, my neurons and my uh, brain physiology. Uh, I don't believe I have an immortal soul, no, but okay. um, that's my personal belief. And what about a disabled person who is uh, severely mentally disabled and is not able to make choices, do they have a spirit? Are they a human being? They're a human being. They belong to the species Homo sapiens. Their ancestry is Homo sapiens, so of course they're human beings, yes. Uh, and do they have a spirit or a soul? It's not a, meaning, it's not a meaningful word. It's a, it's, I mean, they have a spirit or a soul in just the same sense as I have, uh, but I only have a, sent a spirit or a soul in a very much different meaning that, than, your, than your meaning. The way I understood you to say it, it's because of a, your conscious, uh, or, or even your consciousness, which would be different things. But uh, for someone, though, who is not capable of making decisions, uh, would they, do they have a spirit or a soul? Well, if you mean somebody whose brain is so disabled that they have no consciousness at all, then they have no consciousness. I've answered your question. Well, no, because uh, a spirit or a soul is, is different. That's your word. It's not a word that I acknowledge or recognize as a meaningful word. Then I, from what I understand you're saying then, if someone does not have the ability to be conscious, then they would not have a spirit or soul. A human placenta is a genetical identical twin to the baby that it nourished. I, I don't think either of us would wish to say that it has a spirit or a soul because it doesn't have a brain. So if uh, uh, only a, a being that has a material, um, well, let me back up on that, it's the material, the matter, the brain, the, or, or the consciousness, like, well, let me back there, because those are two separate things. I, I guess I'm confused in what you're saying, that a brain means you have a soul, um, a consciousness means you have a soul, but someone whose brain is not functioning, would they then not have a soul? Someone who, who didn't have a brain that was capable of consciousness, somebody who was a human vegetable in effect, uh, would not have the properties that you call a soul and mm -hmm. that I might call a soul for the sake of argument, but I okay. don't think it's immortal. That's the main difference between us. And I think that's very key because that then would work out in how you and I or someone who believes like you do and someone who believes like I do would treat someone who is in uh, what's been called a very, I think it's a horrible term, but a vegetative state, that we would still treat that human being as a person who's deserving of loving respect that should be fed and cared for, even though they can't for themselves. How would you treat a, a, how would you treat a chimpanzee who was in full command of her faculties? Yes, and that's where we would differ. We believe that human beings have souls, have spirits, and that animals should uh, absolutely are cared for. Uh, that's a um, great teaching that comes from our beliefs uh, that we, that we uh, care for animals. But we recognize that there's a difference between animals and humans, and one of the differences is a spirit. When do you use the word we quite often for people who, who think like you? So w would it be right that the CWA is part of a sort of wider constituency within America? Yes, uh, we represent uh, 500,000 ourselves, but that's just a drop in the bucket of the number of people who believe similarly. And we find that uh, as uh, these challenges come up, say in school districts, that there are a number of parents and families and communities who um, will uh, uh, rise up in concern over the 
the fact that only evolution is allowed to be taught and no, not, of the, not the questioning of evolution. So it's, um, it's quite widespread in the United States. The belief that uh, human beings are distinct uh, is a widespread belief in the United States. And it, that's remarkable because evolution has been so heavily taught in the last number of decades. And the fact that it's being taught so um, strongly and, uh, and isolated from other information or evidence, and yet many people continue to believe that uh, God has a hand in creating us, I think helps to show that people are using their critical factories. They're not just believing what's being taught in the schools. Uh, and, um, and that uh, evolutionism is going to continue continue to have a bit of a challenge here in the United States and beyond. Mm. I've, I've been reading your website and I, I get the feeling there's almost a feeling of sort of persecution. I mean, as though, as though somehow you feel that the establishment in the United States is, 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 is against Christianity. That, that puzzles me a bit because, I mean, you know, you, you've got the, the White House, you've got the Supreme Court, you've got, um, well, you, well, you had both houses of Congress until quite recently. Um, how can you feel persecuted yeah. in the face of this overwhelming Christian dominance in the United States? Yeah. Uh, um, many Christians have experienced the hostility toward our beliefs, but beyond hostility, the attempts to even censor and punish us for our beliefs. And uh, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance, uh, that we must continue to fight for our freedom uh, in order to have it. And even though some may believe that the three branches of government uh, reflect our views, that's uh, not necessarily the case. Um, but let me give you my, uh, uh, my own experiences. Uh, a number of years ago, I was praying in public across the street from an abortion clinic and was uh, sentenced to six months in jail for simply praying. It's these kinds of experiences. Uh, excuse me, you were sentenced to six months in jail for praying? For praying. C could we get a bit more detail about sure. that? Sure. Um, a judge had signed an injunction uh, stating that uh, certain things could not be done within 100 feet of abortion clinics in that city in Houston. And so four of us knelt and prayed across the street from the clinic, and uh, the judge sentenced us to six months in jail and a $500 fine. What, what law was that? Was it, that it was an injunction. And an injunction is essentially a judge-made law. It only applies to certain people. Uh, I, I was not named on the injunction, and yet the judge found me guilty of it. Thankfully, she was overturned by a higher court. But there are experiences like that throughout the United States um, where certain people are um, uh, uh, told uh, and punished for acting out their beliefs. And it's those kinds of cases that make us very sensitive to protecting all of our liberties. Mm. I can't have a feeling the context must have been. Had, had that abortion clinic been, been threatened with no, fire in fact, or anything like that? No, it had, none, it had not. Um, uh, there were protests that were going on during that time. Now, the abortion clinic had argued to the judge that women would be intimidated from going, coming into the clinic if there were protesters outside. Well, at the same time that four of us were quietly kneeling in prayer with no signs or anything like that. There were about a hundred pro-abortion demonstrators in front of the clinic blocking the entrance, screaming and yelling with signs and bullhorns. But it was those of us who were quietly kneeling in prayer who were sentenced to six months in jail. So you, I think maybe you can understand then why we are so sensitive to wanting to protect our religious freedoms and the ability to act on our consciences because we do have cases like this where uh, people have been punished for acting on their beliefs. Yes, I, I can't comment on a particular anecdote like that, of course. Um, just want to come back one, one more time to the the idea of teaching the controversy. In, in science, we're well used to controversy, and, it, and we, we have controversy all the time. Since Darwin's time, plenty of things that, that Darwin thought have now been shown to be wrong. I mean, Darwin was completely wrong about genetics, for example. And so there are modern controversies in, in Darwinism. There are controversies between people who think that natural selection is all important in driving evolution. Uh, and there are people who think that, there, that natural selection is only part of it and that there are other things that drive evolution. Nobody seriously doubts the fact of evolution, but there are controversies about whether evolution is largely driven by natural selection or only partly driven by natural selection, for example. There are controversies about whether evolution goes smoothly and continuously or whether it goes in jumps, whether there are sort of long periods where not much evolution ha happens, and then a rather sudden burst of evolution uh, 
which, which represent a kind of step in the fossil record. Those are genuine controversies, and of course it's extremely right and proper that children should be taught those controversies. But when you say teach the controversy, by which I think you mean the controversy between science on the one hand and probably biblical creation on the other, there are lots and lots of creation myths. I mean, the Genesis myth is just happens to be the, the Babylonian Jewish myth, which for historical accident reasons is largely prevalent in the United States. But I mean, why not teach the Hindu myth that we're the product of a cosmic butter churn or an Australian Aboriginal myth that we come from the dream time? Why, why pick on the Judeo-Christian Babylonian myth? What we have argued when we say teach the controversy is teach the controversies in evolution um, and to teach the evidence that shows intelligent design. Uh, I'm not aware of people arguing that they ought to, uh, that in public schools it ought to be taught the um, Biblical accounts of creation. Uh, so what oh, really? we what we um, uh, uh, when we say teach the controversy, we mean teach uh, the all the evidence uh, that including the um, evidence that goes against evolution. Teach the evidence for intelligent design. Who, who do you think the intelligent designer was? Uh, well, see, that's something that I think scientists would, would can debate. But the idea that there was a, an, an intelligent design to the process. In fact, uh, what you've mentioned regarding even natural selection and that there could be uh, 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 somebody or something that put all these laws in place that now the world is operating off of does uh, um, back up this idea that there it was an, a being, an intelligent being, that caused all this, the whole world, to happen. Yes. I mean, that's what a bishop might say. I, I wouldn't say that, but, but, but there, are, there are plenty of Christians who would, who, who would say that. Wouldn't your life be a lot easier if you went along with the bishops and, and said, the, the, the evidence in favor of the fact of evolution is overwhelming, <laughs> so let's accept it and bring God in there? I think um, um, one issue is this idea that, um, that we take orders from a, a hierarchy. Okay, no, and, I, that, that, that's And um, there are some bishops that believe like you do, and there are other bishops that don't, yes. that believe differently. No. And so it's easy to select those who believe like you do and, and rely wholly as if they speak for everyone. Yes. But the, those bishops don't speak. No. No. All Christian okay, I mean, I, I accept that, and I, I would hate to suggest that you take uh, orders from authority. Uh, I, I do wish you look at the facts a bit more, though. I mean, they, they are <laughs> actually very interesting. I mean, you'd be fascinated. Just, just I, read yes, a book. Yes, I think, uh, uh, well, I, I find that to be quite demeaning to claim that we don't read, that we don't read books or that we don't know uh, what evolution is when in fact most of us have been through the museums that you and your folks have put together. Yes. It, um, it probably would be helpful to the dialogue if the evolutionists were not so demeaning and degrading to others. And again, I kind of go back to perhaps that comes out of the philosophy of evolution that some people are better than others. You said there was no evidence of intermediates in evolution and I told you about five Fossils, I and what I, what I say, if, if that were the, and if those were valid, there would be tons of evidence there because, is. because there are so many different species that there ought to be tons of evidence, even let's say for one percent of the uh, macro evolution that's taken place, there should be evidence. But there's there not is. even one percent, let alone no. 10 or 50 or 70 percent. There is a massive amount of evidence. You just need to go into the books and go into the museums and look at it. It's there. Yes, and You're we believe in people we have who are been, telling you there's only one oh, percent. And again, I go back to it's um, it's very demeaning to say that uh, we only believe what we believe because we've been told that, and yet we have evolutionary scientists who want to be the ones to tell all of society what is fact and what's not fact, and to censor out information that is inconvenient. I'm asking you to go and look at the facts. I don't want you to believe me. Just go and look at the facts. Yes, and I, and I have. And again, I go back to uh, um, the, let's look at the differences of uh, what your philosophy lives out, the evolutionary philosophy, and how does that end up working out in a society? Yeah, I, I've, I've accepted that, it, that if, we, if we worked out society on Darwinian grounds, it would be a very, very unpleasant yes. right-wing society. Uh, I've accepted that. Well, I don't know right-wing. I, again, I, it seems to be that you fall back on ad hominem name-calling. All right, um, then, free market. And, free and market, even, uh, and ruthless trampling on the poor, 
uh, that's what it would be like. What I find we interesting, though, is... We don't want a Darwinian society. I don't want a Darwinian society. Communism was based on atheistic beliefs, beliefs and evolutionary beliefs. And communism resulted in a decade that had more deaths, over 100 million deaths committed because of communism, than all the killings uh, combined of every century prior to that. So when uh, you talk about um, uh, socialism, which is a close cousin to communism being a better way of life, I look back on what, uh, uh, what beliefs was communism and socialism based on, and the atheistic belief that human beings are not distinct and should not be respected. When you say distinct, do you mean distinct from each other, or, or do you mean when human beings are not distinct from each other? Is that what that you human mean? beings are created uh, as distinct from one another and should be treated and should be treated with respect, even if they are not utilitarian, you know, even if they are uh, not able to provide something to society. The atheistic belief, the evolutionary belief, is that you're unnecessary and unneeded if you cannot pro um, provide something for society. Uh, that's an extraordinary thing to say. I mean, you, you equated atheistic with evolutionary. That means that's wiping out most of the bishops. Uh, they wouldn't take very kindly to that. I know well, that what I, and I, I recognize that there are varying degrees within uh, uh, the evolutionary beliefs. It's the hardcore evolutionists that reject the idea of a creator that then pave the foundation for very brutal societies. Well, I, I have accepted that if we were to base our societies on Darwinian principles, they would be brutal, harsh, and unpleasant. I have told you that I want not to live in a Darwinian society. Mm -hmm. I've suggested to you that it might be a good idea to learn something about Darwinism so as to know what to avoid in setting up society. And it would be helpful to learn what are the characteristics that make a uh, successful and healthy society. And let's build on those characteristics. I agree with that, and among those characteristics would be critical thinking, a yes. respect for education, a respect for evidence. And respect for human beings. And a respect for human beings, very much so. Regardless respect. of whether they can provide for society or provide yes. something to yes, society. Yes, indeed. That's the essence of the liberal philosophy which I espouse, that human beings should be respected, their health should be taken care of. Even if they don't have a functioning yes. brain that is conscious. They should be given, their, their hospital care should be taken care of by the state. That's a liberal principle which I espouse. It's an un-Darwinian principle. And uh, see, I believe that it's not a state, because a state is an institution or an entity. It's human beings that provide care for others. Well, OK, human beings provide care for others. None of that bears on the truth of whether evolution actually happened. And that is a matter of fact. It's like gravity. You can't get away from fact. <laughs> Study the fact, learn the facts, and then make up the society that you want to live in on the basis of the facts as they are. Yeah, and the facts that would include what makes a best, the better society is one where there is deep respect for each human being, uh, and a I'm way all to inculcate for deep respect for each human and being. the way to inculcate respect for human beings is by um, seeing that they were created. By with you, a, so you would, with would, a would, loving, you, would you actually distort creator. the scientific fact in order to create respect? There's no, for there's no need to distort because, as I mentioned, uh, uh, science is a technique, a tactic for discovering and unlocking the keys of how this world works. And so we don't need to deny any facts because um, the, we, the facts end up bearing out uh, um, our beliefs. So it takes, sometimes it takes time for science to catch up with um, the, the, the beliefs that have made the best societies. Sometimes it takes a while for science to, they may stumble across something and, and take the wrong interpretation from it, build a philosophy on it, and then later realize, oops, that, uh, that, that, uh, that wasn't correct. So science oftentimes changes its own beliefs uh, based on new evidence that comes forward. But oftentimes what ends up happening is, as science progresses, it backs up the belief that there's an intelligent designer. Science proceeds by what the philosopher Karl Popper called conjectures and refutations. So, um, you, you have an idea, you have a hypothesis, and then you see if you can refute it. And uh, a, th a theory is, I mean, a, a well-substantiated theory is always one that has yet to be refuted. So the, the more um, a theory has been attempted to be refuted and, and has yet to come through with flying colors, the, the more accepted it is. And uh, after a point, de facto, it gets called a fact after. I mean, the, um, 
the theory that the Earth goes round the Sun uh, is only a theory. It's only a theory, that, but it's never been refuted, and we all know it never will be refuted. That, that's how science proceeds. It's, a, it, it's, it's conjecture and refutation. That's the state that evolution is in. I mean, it's, it's a bit like the theory that the Earth goes round the Sun. It's, it, it is only a theory. But to a scientist, that can mean, in this case does mean, that it's never been refuted. And the more it goes on from decade to decade to decade and, it, and, and is not refuted, the more closely does it approximate to what everybody calls a fact. Then an evolutionist should have no problem with there being questioning of it and Absolutely not. I mean, challenging no. yeah. of it you're, and you're right. to be willing to teach the challenges to it, uh, to be willing to talk about the evidence against it. And that's where I find um, the hardcore evolutionists have a bit of a problem. It's like an, an oak tree in a storm. Because it is so rigid, it's more likely to then fall and break, whereas uh, um, uh, those that are more open to being challenged can then bend uh, mm. uh, with, with the facts that come forward. So that's why what uh, our, uh, many of us in the United States are arguing for teach the controversies in the schools, allow the information that shows the flaws in evolution to be taught. Uh, don't blackball uh, scientists who may not agree wholeheartedly with the hardcore version of evolution to be blackballed out of the um, profession. Uh, uh, allow people to um, have enough respect for people to give to allow them to have all the information so they can make up their yeah. own minds. It's a difficult question, this thing about blackballing, and I, I, it's, 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 a, it's a nasty idea to blackball, yes. of course. I mean, what, what about somebody who, who's teaching geography, who believes in, a f in the flat earth? I mean, would you blackball them? <laughs> uh, well, always extreme cases are used. That's, <clears throat> that's not what we're facing here in the United States. What we're facing are scientists who may not agree wholeheartedly with the hardcore view of evolution, who do believe in intelligent design. They're being denied their careers. Well, they're being denied. So it's better to argue from the facts of what's happening rather than some hypothetical. OK. Um, let, let, let's take intelligent design. I mean, the, le the leading intelligent design proponents in this country uh, believe in evolution. They, they believe that we're um, <coughs> cousins of chimpanzees, we're cousins of kangaroos, etc. Uh, but what they don't believe is that God is completely absent from the process. So they, they believe in evolution, but they believe that God, as it were, helped evolution over the difficult jumps. There are some things that they call irreducibly complex, uh, which, um, and, and scientists dispute that they're irreducibly complex, but the point is they do believe in evolution. They do believe that, that we're descended from reptiles, for example. Well, I it's, think just that they, it's just that they think that God helped over certain of the difficult stages. Mm -hmm. So it would be wonderful to interview them and let them speak to themselves, present their information and their evidence. Yes. Uh, and, uh, and to show that there are a variety of views. And that's why the hardcore evolutionists should not have a monopoly on what is allowed to be discussed or um, researched in science. Would you, would you accept, well, nobody's going to make any restriction on what you're allowed to research, of course. Um, well, that's done, of course, through funding, through grants, through positions at universities. There are ways to yeah. restrict what can and can't be yes, researched. I mean, funding of, of, of scientific research is always a problem, and all scientists have a time when they grumble about not getting funding. I mean, you, you do have to, you're competing in a marketplace, and the NSF and other grant-giving bodies have to give money where peer review suggests it's going to be most useful. I mean, that, that is definitely a problem, of course. Um, would you accept that, that, that what you call teaching the controversy should be done in classes of religion or classes of history of ideas well, rather than classes of science? Teaching the controversy refers to teaching the evidence and the facts. Uh, that help that dispute evolution. So it should be taught in the science classes because it's teaching evidence. Yes, I mean, when, when I asked you about evidence, you said there are no fossil intermediates. And when I told you about fossil intermediates, you changed the subject. <laughs> I mean, no, what I, when I don't change the subject, what I say is that if there were, uh, if, um, if there had been evolution from slime to human beings, that there'd be a massive amount of evolution, uh, of, of, sorry, um, if there was uh, evidence of going from slime to human beings, there'd be a massive amount of evidence uh, showing uh, interspecies, from one macrospecies to another. And that's where I, I find 
the concept of evolution lacking. And so the burden really is on the evolutionists. Oftentimes it's been thrown back at us that we just need to look at the well, information. I, but well, no, but let well, me throw it back on you okay. all to say, look, this is what you, what's needed to convince us. So you need to come up with, an, uh, with um, a, a large amount of evidence to back up this claim that there's been a large progression of macroevolution throughout the years. Yes. How are we going to make you look at it, though? Because, I mean, I've told well, you... Well, no, no, no. We look at it. We look at it. Again, when I go back to... Uh, it's easy to blame the other person uh, to say the, and to blame by saying that we're ignorant. But what I'm saying to you is if there um, were enough evidence, it would convince even... Uh, um, uh, uh, it will convince those who are open to the information. There are such, uh, there's such a vast number of people in the United States and elsewhere who do believe in an intelligent design, that there is a creator. Uh, if there was a vast amount of evidence, solid evidence to back up evolution, that would influence a significant number of the vast number of people who believe mm. in intelligent See, design. I, that, that sends me close to despair because because the, the evidence is there. I mean, I, I keep telling you about <laughs> it. No, let, just let me tell you some of, some of it. There is, there is evidence from, of, for example, the transition from fish coming out of the water onto the land. It's beautiful evidence. It's elegant. I mean, they're, they're lovely fossils. Uh, go, to, go to Philadelphia and have a, have a look at the wonderful fossil they've got there. Go to, I'm sure they have replicas in the, in the, in the Smithsonian here. Um, just, just look at that evidence. It's beautiful. The evidence for the, the transition between the reptilian jaw and the mammalian jaw. The reptilian jaw has several bones. The mammalian lower jaw has only one bone. And the other bones that were in the reptile have now moved into the inner ear. It's a beautiful transition. So what is your, what is your cause in life? It, it, I would think that if your cause was to convince others that evolution is correct, and not just a theory, but a fact, uh, then you'd be devoting yourself to finding this information and making it readily, readily available. What I find is that you're spending a lot of time arguing with me, trying to convince oh. me, instead of, uh, instead of showing the evidence yes. or spending your time yes. producing evidence. Uh, w w was I not just telling you about fish that are no. intermediate uh, that between the sea? But again, what I go back to is if, 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 this were, if there was a uh, large enough uh, uh, amount of evidence, which there should be, if we have gone from slime to human beings, there should be an overwhelming amount of evidence, not these isolated cases that could be They're interpreted differently. And, see, the problem, one problem that evolutionists have is that in the past, when there's been great acclaim of a discovery to show um, from one species to another, it's been proven to be fraudulent. So evolutionists have a problem. Uh, in their own history. The fact that there have been so many cases of fraud or misinterpretation of information that now we uh, have a problem believing what you say. There was the Piltdown Man in the 1920s. Uh, I suggest we forget about the 1920s and look at today. <laughs> Go and look at some, uh, some modern paleontology labs. Go and talk uh. to some modern paleontologists. Uh, go and talk to the people who are looking at the transition from fish to amphibians. Go and look at the, uh, at the uh, fossils about the human transition. Look at the evolution of the horse. Look at the evolution of the elephant. There are evolution of the whale. There are so many beautiful stories. I mean, you'd be fascinated. You, you would think that these fossil histories are to the greater glory of God if so you go and would look it, at them. Would, would it make you happy? If uh, we were to agree uh, in uh, that there is some evidence regarding macroevolution, um, would that alone make you happy, or would you still be unhappy and feel that your cause is unsuccessful if many of us still believe that there's an intelligent being who caused this to happen? It would make me enormously happy. I would love it. If you, if you said, yes, 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 evolution is obviously a fact. I accept evolution, but God did it. I mean, that, that wouldn't, I mean, I wouldn't agree with that, but it would make me hugely happy. At least you looked at the why, evidence. And I don't understand why that's so important to you that I believe exactly like you believe. No, no, it's not important to me. Um, I am an educator. I'm a scientist. I'm, an, I'm a university professor. I teach. I love it when people see the beauty of nature, the beauty of evidence, and, and just in, look at it and, 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 and appreciate how, how elegant it is. It really is beautiful. Go and look at it. What is the danger in believing in an intelligent designer? I, I don't think that's a danger. Uh, that's a, that's a well, 
as an atheist, which I am, a very strong atheist, uh, I have quite a quite separate agenda. That is an agenda, but it's not my agenda as a, scienti as a science educator. I'm now talking purely as a scientist and a science educator, and I am distressed that somebody as intelligent as you is refusing to look at the evidence. And um, what is your agenda as an atheist? Because that, that is going to influence the work that you do. Well, I like to think it's not, actually, uh, but um, for what, what, whatever I might say about that, I've done another television program about that, and, and I was a very strong atheist in that, in that program. This program is about Darwin, and uh, there are many Darwinians who are not atheists, and all I'm talking about now is the factual evidence, and I'm suggesting to you that you might do a better job for your religion if you would open your mind to the factual evidence and realize that actually you could use the genuine scientific factual evidence to the greater glory of your God rather than running away from the evidence. Uh, but again, that's where we differ. We don't believe we are running away from the evidence. And what we are seeking to do is to uh, help people to understand um, who God is, that he's a loving God. And part of his love toward us is that he created us. The fact that he wanted us to exist. Maybe and he that, did it via evolution, though. And um, uh, the, the um, helping people to understand that there's a God who has created order in this universe, and that there are certain, as, you, as you've mentioned, laws in this universe. Um, that even includes moral laws, moral laws of how we are to treat one another. Uh, then. Um, uh, the work that we're working toward is helping people to understand these moral laws uh, and live according to these moral laws because not only will they benefit living healthier and happier lives, but our society will as well. And so um, uh, each of the work that we do through Concerned Women for America is toward that end. Mm. Now, you have your own cause. You're going to devote your life to that. And I would hope that you could respect and appreciate the work that we're doing uh, to help make society a better place by helping people to understand the moral laws uh, not only exist, but they're the best for each one of us and as a society. And you can go to sleep at night happy, uh, hopefully, knowing that we're being successful in our work because it will make a better society, one that Darwin's beliefs would not have made. Yes, well, I've, I've gone into that, haven't I? I? I agree with you that Darwinian beliefs would not make for a good society. I've said they'll make for a bad society. And what's society. lacking, as you've mentioned, what's lacking is uh, um, uh, the... Um, uh, what's lacking in Darwin needs to be made up with somewhere else. The fact that Darwinian mm -hmm. is such a heart, would lead to such a harsh and brutal life means that there is a great need for other people to be making this world a better place. Yeah, and that's, true, that's I mean, what we are working on. Yeah. And even though I may not agree like you do, hopefully you can appreciate the work that we're doing yeah. to make society a better place.